Okay, now this is probably why you've all come, for the complementary medicines, vitamins and more. Now to start off with, I will have a disclaimer that I am not a complementary medicine expert. I am a practitioner, as an advanced practitioner of pharmacists, and I try and do something that is sensible for the person. So it's a very difficult area for me, as well as for you guys too, because a lot of this is a belief system, and I respect individual patients' wishes. So it's back to the old do no harm. So let's have a look. And you might say, how do I cope with this? I work in a community pharmacy where I've got shelves and shelves of complementary medicines. So am I conflicting my own evidence-based approach by selling these products? And it's a very difficult one because I like my job and I want to keep it. But so I, I treat people the way I would like to be treated myself. <coughs> Somebody comes in and they, wait a minute, I haven't put my speaker on. Get it, put my speaker. If they come in and they ask me, or they just go and select something off the shelf and they go and take it up to the cash register, that's up to them. It's caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. They haven't asked me. But if they come to me and they say, could I have something for, and they're looking at the complementary medicines, or is this any good, I will give them the evidence that I have and let them make their own decision. Okay, because it's quite a difficult conflict. Okay, so let's go. So vitamins and minerals are used for lots. We need them in our bodies, not just for nutritional um, deficiencies as well. So um, the evidence-based uh, guidance is often insufficient. These companies have not got the funds that Big Pharma have got to run the double-blind, randomised, controlled studies. So that's one of the concerns about it. Um, they were our traditional medicines. If we look back to the Aboriginal medicines, the Chinese medicines, the Maori medicines, I have great respect for those. And years ago, I was fortunate to do a ward round in a Beijing hospital. And that was absolutely fantastic because I actually studied pharmacognosy, which is the actual natural drugs and extracting them in my pharmacy course years and years ago in New Zealand. Anyhow, here they were with all the herbs and they had drawers with um, leaves in and roots and all the rest of it. And we had a patient that had been on a tenolol, um, he'd been on Chinese medicines, then he'd been on a tenolol, and he didn't like it, he didn't like the side effects of it, and he said, I want to go back onto my Chinese medicines. So he was hospitalised for two weeks to get him stable on the brew of the antihypertensive herbs that were actually done at the Beijing hospital, and he was stabilised. But you can see it's variable because it depends which side of the hill the herb grew on, what part of the plant it's taken from. So there's so many variables. And we also have adulteration. So it's very tricky. So here we are. Oh my God, I'm rich. Silver in the hair, gold in the teeth, crystals in the kidneys, sugar in the blood, lead in the butt, iron in the arteries, and an inexhaustible supply of natural gas. I never thought I'd accumulate such wealth. So just introducing ourselves. <laughs> okay. So... We'll talk about what the evidence is, and we'll talk, go through some of them. I'm happy to take questions. As I say, I'm not an authority. I will go and check it out if I've got a particular um, case where somebody asks me something that I don't know. Um, there's a lot of resources around these days. So the Complementary Medicines Association are in the whole thing for money. If we look at the stats, it depends whether it's 66% or 70% of Australians at any point in time are taking a complementary medicine. So in this room, how many people are taking a complementary medicine? There you are. We've got oh, probably about 50% here. But what's happened is some of the things that were seen as complementary medicine have now become as mainline, such as vitamin D, which is what I'm owning up to. Okay? So that's exactly it. But it's a multi-million dollar business, and we can see by the ads of all the sporting events that um, how people are making money out of consumers' vulnerability. And I think that's where I'm concerned about people are, have got belief systems of things that are really placebos, but they believe in them. And one could argue, is this right or is it wrong? And that's an ethical issue. So if we look at the um, um, dietary use in the Australian population, the most common dietary supplement was the multivitamin with it. And that was followed closely by the fish oil, which has now had the thumbs down with it. So your vitamins are complementary medicines, um, just by the way, it is spelt correctly. It is complementary with an E. It's not an I because they are not free. And a lot of people want to spend it with an I. <laughs> and then, so they're complementary to your existing medicines. So you could say alternative medicine is something quite different. I'm talking about complementary in addition to standard medicines that we use in Australia. So that's your, 
Your vitamins, minerals, nutritionals, herbals, homeopathics, essential oils, Chinese medicine is included. Now, of interest, every product that is sold in Australia in the health food shops and the pharmacy has to be registered by TGA. Now, there are two categories. One is OSTL and the other is OSTR. So your medicines that are on prescriptions are OSTR. The medicines that are have uh, been shown to be safe but we haven't got sufficient evidence are OSTL. And if you look at your bottles of your bottles of your cough and cold tablets, your cough, and, your cough mixtures, your vitamins, most of them will be OSTL, which has been shown that they've been safe as a product but haven't had the studies to show that they're effective. There's only about three or four that are actually OSTR. And incidentally, they're made by a company called Floridus that's put a lot of money into their um, research with it that's ergast uh, for the um, irritable bowel syndrome and a few other there, um, uh, one for phlegm. But yeah, generally they are OSTL. So there's your OSTL there, and I've got a bit more about it, and you can have a look at the TGA. Now, some of you might have watched Jenny Brocky's show on the SBS Insider. If you haven't, it's worthwhile watching. It was a fairly vocal sort of one where we had Ken Harvey getting very upset, unfortunately. He's one of our sort of people that question the TGA and he's got a lot of um, uh, bones to pick with them because they have been, as he describes, toothless tigers and haven't actually acted on a lot of the things, basically because they haven't got the resources. Then you had people like Leslie Braun and Gerald Quigley and a couple of pharmacists, one of which I found very um, odd with her vitamin C infusions and couldn't really endorse what she was saying. Then you had the consumers that actually were believers who had found great benefit. So uh, I thought she did a particularly good job at a very difficult program. They're always challenging programs to have these panels of believers versus non-believers versus people in the centre with it, with the nutritionists. So what I'm trying to give you today is a balanced viewpoint that you can make up your minds and you know where to find some more literature about it. So let's have a look. Vitamins are organic substances found in um, the body, but some of them are not made in the body. We need only small amounts. There are certain um, groups that are deficient at um, possible group groups. If you've um, got alcoholism, you need to have some vitamin B1. And how long you keep up the vitamin B1 after you've given up the alcohol is also debatable, but I will start to de-prescribe it if I've found that they're completely off the um, alcohol with it. Pregnant women certainly need folic acid in very small doses to prevent the spinal bifida. If you've got phenytoin, you're going to have a deficiency in folic acid and a deficiency in vitamin D. People who are housebound, people who've got veils, people like our nurses who are in dark all the time, and pharmacists might very well be deficient because we're not getting sufficient sunlight. So we've got to look at the balance between the sunlight and our work environment as well. Uh, people who are, are vegans uh, may be deficient in vitamin B12 and may need some supplement there. I prefer to have the intramuscular vitamin B12 injection, but there's some people that maintain they get sufficient level from the um, sublingual vitamin B12. I find that we need to check our blood and then we know where we're going. If they want to take that, that's okay. Just get some bloods done and see if they're within the normal level and do their full blood count and then do their B12 and their folate. People with anorexia and bulimia are certainly going to, and after serious illness. So there's our, uh, what we should have, and you're not going to remember that, but that's just for interest. And you can see that they're all micrograms and tiny amounts of trace elements. So if we're eating a good balanced diet, hopefully we should get that with fresh, it's all basically a whole diet these days, fresh fruit and vegetables, which is a big thrust over to in the media as well. So you've got your fat-soluble vitamins, and you've got your water-soluble vitamins. So the fat soluble, it's easy to remember, that's ADEC, A-D-E-K, and they, one, they stay in the body longer, whereas the water soluble ones need to have a regular intake. And those are all the others, all the Bs and the vitamin C with it. So your vitamin A, and I've put just at the top there, which I know you'll be interested in, is that you want to know the chemical formula. But I just wanted to remind you that all these are actually chemicals. You know, they're seen as natural, but they're chemicals. Okay? Oxygen is a chemical, you know? you know? So on the periodic table. So it's needed, we certainly need enough vitamin A, and you get it from generally most of your food, like the liver, the fish oils, the dairy products, your eggs, your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, they've just come in this week. Isn't that exciting for those who like Brussels sprouts? They'd probably be the least like vegetable of, the, of them all, but they're really high in nutrients as well. Apricots, melon, and so on. So you get plenty of it. If you don't have enough, you can't see in the dark. 
but that also could be due to your cataract, so you need to have a look at that, <laughs> and, or your glasses that might need cleaning. Um, so other symptoms can be the dry skin, uh, loss of appetite and diarrhoea, and they may get, people may get more infections with it, and or severe deficiency will lead to other problem complications with your bones. So if you have too much, that's not good either, because you actually can uh, get a lot of side effects from it, including enlargement of the kidney, of the liver and the spleen. Uh, it shouldn't be used with anticoagulants, with roaccutane and acetretinone as well. And we don't use cod liver oil these days, you'll be pleased to know, because it contains too much of the vitamin A to get the vitamin D from. So those of you that were subjected to cod liver oil in the past, that's no longer um, recommended. So your supplementation found, and I looked at, I go to Cochrane Reviews a lot, and Cochrane are freely available. Um, you can get the um, lay version and you can get the more in-depth version. Cochrane Reviews are where they've set out a research question to answer, and then they'll get the literature around it, and they'll look at the studies to see is that question being answered in that population that we're looking at. They might have 100 studies originally, they might only get down to 10 studies that they can actually examine. Then they'll do a meta-analysis to see the answers of that putting it together. The trouble with Cochrane is this takes time. So often there's a big lag between something in the media and then a Cochrane review coming out. Then there might be a Cochrane review that's come out and there's been some new findings that actually will change the Cochrane review. But it's a good guide to give you a good background and it's freely available as well. So that Cochrane review in uh, 2017 looked at, well, did it help measles in children? Did it help cystic fibrosis? And so on. And they didn't find any evidence in that one. And you can read all those. Now, vitamin D, highly controversial at present. Um, vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, um, and that promotes the absorption of the calcium. Now, we've had a huge uptake in vitamin D in Australia. We've had a huge uptake in the pathology testing, so much so that the Medi Bank have said, no, we can only test, uh, and so infrequently, otherwise you're going to be audited, which is a bit of a concern. And they've also changed the levels of what is our, when we don't really know what our normal level is. It's sort of a bit of a seat of the pants guess, but if you're above 50 to 75, 80 nanomoles per litre, you're probably okay. So uh, very, very controversial about that. So it promotes the reabsorption of calcium by the kidney, necessary for the parathyroid gland, maintaining their calcium levels, and it maintains your main homeostasis in your <coughs> bones with it. So you only need about 400 international units per day. Now, some people <coughs> can actually uh, get it from the sun. I'm one that I've got a particular... I, I'm deficient in vitamin D, as was my mother, as was my, as my daughter, and I have to take vitamin D supplements. So when I had my readings, they were 25, and you go, oh, oh my goodness. You know, so once I've supplemented, I'm now, and I supplement every day. It's controversial whether you take the vitamin D 1,000 units every day, whether you take it once a week, whether you take it once a month, whether you take it once a year. The evidence has definitely come through against once a year with, uh, because there's an increased incidence of microfractures and it's starting to come that way with once a month. So I'm putting that one as a question mark for those of you that are taking it once a month. We certainly make them in the pharmacy where I work as a compounding pharmacy and sell once a month. But I've got a, big, a bit of a question mark over this one until I see more. I'm quite happy taking mine once a day because I'm in the habit of it. So you're safe with that, you're safe with the once a week, the once a month, watch this space. It might be okay, but I'm not, I can't give you the answer on that one at this stage. So um, you, the scheduling is, if it's 25 micrograms, you can go and buy it from the pharmacy. If you want to have the, uh, anything higher than that, you require a prescription for it. And usually we give out six capsules for six months because of the expiry date. So there's a uh, association um, between calcium and vitamin D in a community dwelling, and this particular paper said that the findings do not support the return use of supplements in community dwelling um, uh, older adults. And I've given you the full reference there that is freely available that you can actually Google that and you can find out of that one that they said it wasn't associated in a significant disc, uh, risk of, of reduction with hip fractures. So we've um, got a few other papers around. There was one written by Mike Borland um, that got into the medic um, British Medical Journal, J 
journal and Mark Bolan was the one who wrote the paper on the calcium and I was very suspicious about his analysis of that one. He actually happens to be a New Zealander out of Auckland University, which is a bit of a concern. Um, so as soon as I saw this one and his bottom line said, our findings suggest that vitamin D supplementation does not prevent fractures or falls or have clinically meaningful effects on bone mineral density. There are no differences between the higher and the lower doses of vitamin D. Little justification to use vitamin D supplements to maintain or improve musculoskeletal health. This conclusion should be reflected in the clinical guidelines. So, of course, I saw this. I thought, oh, Mark Borlin, and I've looked at the papers, and I'm not completely happy with his meta-analysis analysis. I don't know if you've looked at that either. But he's got some that were on calcium and vitamin D, some that were just on vitamin D. So, of course, there's been a number of uh, studies. There was the editorial in the same journal saying, is this the end of the story? And then there was another one for the Australian population to say, well, um, there's a problem in the, in the review because some of the earlier meta-analysis showed where it works. It's vitamin D plus calcium, not vitamin D alone, that reduce the factors in the falls. But that's debatable too, because if they're actually having enough calcium in their diet, then it should be the same. So, currently, the guidelines in Australia have not changed. So it's controversial. Watch this space. Interesting one. Um, there's no harm in giving it for the person um, who wants to, but just check their levels. And if, if they're 75, 80, and they want to keep taking it, so be it. If they're certainly low, I'll be certainly encouraging it. But yeah, so that's where I am at present with this one. Um, I've put the causes of deficiency there, the people that are at higher risk. And it was a slip, slop, slap campaign that actually meant that we didn't get sufficient absorption of the vitamin D. So it can be abnormal gut function, malabsorption. People with celiac disease are far more likely to have deficiency, so certainly look out for those with it as well, and those who actually have reduced synthesis of the vitamin D. And some drugs will cause the deficiencies of the vitamin D. Okay, so what happens if you have too much? Um, and you've got to have a great lot to get these side effects such as the nausea and vomiting, and the renal or the cardiovascular damage. In severe renal impairment, um, I discourage the use because really you're looking at at what point can you convert it to the usable vitamin D. In that case, you're going, I don't know if any of you are working as renal nurses in that, but you certainly would be going to uh, Rocatrol with that one as well. And corticosteroids, <coughs> the long-term people, can impair the vitamin D metabolism. That's generally the oral vitamin D, oral uh, corticosteroids, rather than the um, inhaled corticosteroids. So the very high doses certainly showed that they actually had increased risk of fractures. So I wouldn't go for the once a year one. So there's a lot of drug interactions with vitamin D. With uh, phenobarb and phenytoin, um, you need to increase the vitamin D. Orlistat, which is used for your weight reduction, your Xenica, that's going to reduce your absorption. So those people who are using it, we are hardly, I don't think I've dispensed it in Yonks. It just hasn't been all that popular because people don't like the copious amounts of fatty stools that come out. Um, the thiazides, they, those people might actually have, have um, uh, potential to lower the urinary excretion of calcium and resulting in hypercalcemia, so we need to monitor the serum calcium in those people as well. And digoxin with vitamin D, you may get increased in the serum calcium levels, which actually could potentially give you more arrhythmias. So just monitor the serum calcium in that one. Okay, um, before we move on further, um, no, I'll deal with on calcium. Um, so vitamin E, the alpha tocopherol, that's a dietary compound. Um, there used to be a lot of vitamin E used when I first started in pharmacies in the 60s and the 70s with it. Um, people were taking a lot of supplementations. Then it was implicated in helping heart disease. Then it was actually implicated in causing heart disease. So that dropped right down with it. So it certainly can interact with your anticoagulants, particularly warfarin with it, digoxin and iron. The evidence of the cardiovascular it shows that high-dose vitamin E supplementation may increase all cause. That's taking more than 400 international units a day. So I wouldn't be taking huge amounts of, of vitamin E, and you get, can get that from your wheat germ capsules as well with it. So moving to the water-soluble ones, as I said, they need to be replaced more frequently. So you need to have your <coughs> liver, kidneys, fish, yeast, nuts, bread, leafy green vegetables, and fresh fruit and vegetables with it. So the B group, you've got B1, thiamine, as we've mentioned, for the person with alcoholism. Riboflavin, um, the deficiency possibly with tricyclics and oral contraceptives. Pyridoxin, your vitamin B6, 
which was certainly used for morning sickness, but you don't want to give too much of it. And I've had one case where we did get a peripheral neuropathy from a person taking excessive doses of vitamin B6 uh, with it. So uh, it certainly can help morning sickness with it. Um, vitamin B12, um, as I said, I prefer the intramuscular um, root better. You certainly do get a deficiency with metformin. So people that are on metformin with diabetes <coughs> will need to check their B12 and their folate. Theoretically, you would get one with the proton pump inhibitors, but I am yet to see it. Um, it does actually make sense that you're actually preventing the um, production of the intrinsic vitamin B12 by suppression of the um, acid pump, but clinically I haven't seen it at this stage. Um, vitamin B3, nicotinic acid, nicotinamide, etc., um, those ones have got evidence for lipid lowering, but they're going to be a very flushed red patient because they get a lot of peripheral flushing from that one as well. Um, there's some dermatologists that are doing some work on the vitamin B3 of treating the sunspots, and you can Google and have a look at the literature on that one. There's certainly a bit of work being done on that. B5 seems to hang in there. It's got many uses. And B um, folic acid, also known as B9, um, deficiency with um, phenytoin, and it's used with methotrexate for treatment of rheumatoid arthritis on every day, other than the day that the methotrexate is taken to minimise some of the gastrointestinal <coughs> side effects for it. The evidence for lowering homocysteine, I don't have the answer for that. I haven't got any evidence for taking a whole lot of low, um, vitamin B9 for lowering homocysteine. So there's a little bit on the vitamin B12. Um, that's associated with malabsorption, so I would suggest that we check that and those that have got peripheral neuropathy also check their B12 as well. Um, they will have a high mean red cell volume or anemia. Now vitamin C. Vitamin C, we've had the Lady Salento, and then we've had the big media hype that said, breakthrough for diabetes. And I immediately looked at that and I found the study, and the study came from Deakin University in Geelong, and it was a very small study of 50 people by somebody's um, research project. So maybe it's got promise, but just watch for the space at present because if you have too much, you're likely to get uh, renal uh, stones, kidney stones from the vitamin C. We certainly need enough vitamin C, and those people that are smokers, small minority now, may require more vitamin C. But if you have too much, you'll get diarrhea, nausea, and stomach cramps. And we saw on this insider show that somebody was having massive infusions of vitamin C for cancer therapy, I think it was, and I don't really endorse that. Or I don't endorse it, not really, I don't endorse it, full stop. Okay, um, I was embarrassed by it. So here's the um, vitamin C study for you. Humble vitamin C to Deacon diabetes. So they improved their postprandial and their 24-hour glycemia, decreased um, blood pressure after uh, four months of supplementation of the ascorbic acid compared to placebo. But if we look at it, it was a randomized um, crossover study of about 50 people. So it's very early days. So there you are for what it's worth. And this is what I follow, so that if somebody asks me about it, I can say, well, there was a study that did show some benefit. But um, you know, if you want to take it and it's doing no harm, that's up to you. But read it. And it depends on the individual how far we can go. So moving on from the vitamins to the minerals. So you've got your um, remembering that back to your old pharmacology and physiology, that you've got your potassium sodium balance, you've got your calcium magnesium balance. So if you get one too high, the other one's going to go down to try and compensate with it as well. So there are many minerals that we need trace elements of, but if we do too much, we've got to think about our balance and particularly with our nerve muscle impulses as well. So calcium, which is really flavor of the year as well. We need calcium. Adult women need 800 to 1,200 um, milligrams per day, adult men about 1,000. So if they're postmenopausal, we're looking at 1,200 milligrams a day. Ideally, your calcium is better from your diet. So you get much better absorption from your diet. You can get lovely calcium counters from your osteoporosis website, uh, osteoporosis.org.au. Go on to the Australian site, not the American site. They've got a very nice counter that you can give out to your patients who are worried about calcium. And those that can't have their dairy products, you know, they then can think about having their sardines or, and their salmon, which are higher than tuna as far as the calcium content goes. And when I tell my oldies, you can have sardines on toast for your lunch, for your calcium, they say, brilliant, I love sardines on toast, because their taste isn't as good and they've got something that they can taste and it's a bit salty. They actually really like that and they're really happy with me. I tell them broccoli too, they're not so happy about that. Or their apricots, um, 
but, and almonds and things like that. There was also another interesting um, non-reference paper, or actually it was reference from Harvard, about why GPs should advise diabetes patients to go nuts for nuts. So there's a big thing about nuts as well, but it's more of the tree nuts rather than the peanuts and beneficial for the heart and beneficial for diabetes. So nuts didn't quite enter into my vitamins and minerals, but I thought I'd mention nuts because they're really nice and uh, you know, uh, one can uh, use those as a good substitute as well, but particularly the almond. So be careful with calcium because you've got interactions with it. With your calcium methylsides, your calcium channel blockers, your calcitriol. Um, and it may absor uh, um, decrease the absorption of some antibiotics and iron. The one that I really worry about and I see, but which I haven't got up there, which just reminded me though, is thyroxin. Now thyroxin should be taken ideally half an hour before food. But I see in a lot of people when I go and look at their, what they're doing, they're taking their thyroxin with their calcium in the morning. In which case the calcium is preventing a lot of the absorption of the thyroxin. The calcium is, I believe, the best time to take it is at night after the evening meal. And you actually get less drug, and, uh, most of your medicines are taken in the morning, so you're reducing that risk, as well as that you need an acid environment for the best absorption of calcium carbonate, and you also get better uptake of the parathyroid gland by having it at night. So that works best. If you're taking two a day, if you take two at once, you actually will won't get um, main absorption from the <coughs> second one. You better take one twice a day. What's it? Some water around at all? Would you give me what you think? Um, so uh, you better take the calcium morning and, or lunchtime and night if you've got to take two. But most of the time, I would suggest that you're better to take just one at night and have your diet so you can do your calcium counter with that. Um, yeah, question. Um, I don't think that there wouldn't be not like a B12 supplement. You would be would iron supplement, yes but not with B12. But B12, as I said, I prefer to have it rather than, thank you, than as an intramuscular injection. Now, if you, um, so let's just have a look there, what I've got. So abnormally low can be if you've got low vitamin D, so you need them hand in hand. Too many coffees, too many lattes. Lattes are double the strength of flat whites, just by the way. It's a very interesting piece of information. Alcohol is not so good with it, decreases your calcium. And some of the um, diets that are high in some of the brands, and particularly spinach and rhubarb, can actually decrease the amount of calcium that is taken up. And certain conditions such as celiac disease, kidney disease, and medications will decrease the um, absorption of the calcium as well with the calcium levels. So we're also concerned about the buildup of calcium in the arteries, and we're doing a lot of the uh, cardiologists will look at coronary calcium as well. So that is a um, concern. And again, I'm back to having the calcium in your food is the best way to go. So osteoporosis, still recommend 1,000 to 1,300 milligrams of calcium per day, taken as a supplement, which is either the calcium carbonate or the calcium citrate. Now, the calcium carbonate tends to be constipating. And that can be a problem for somebody. As well as I've mentioned, the size of the tablets is a concern. So you can get the chewable ones. The calcium citrate, you're going to get better absorption from uh, somebody who is taking a proton pump inhibitor. Because if you've decreased the acid in your body, then you're not going to get as good an absorption from the carbonate. But a warning, Citracal, you require two tablets to equal one of the caltrate. So, um, and currently they have been out of stock. So that is another concern at present. So just eat your yogurt and your cheese and so on and your broccoli. So they're generally well tolerated with it, apart from those um, caveats that I've applied there. Any further questions on calcium? Yes, what I meant to say, and I had a question at the break and I said I'd address it. Now, polio with osteoporosis. Now, that's a big role for you guys. I want recalls on it. As I mentioned before, if you stop taking the polio, then your bone mineral density within a month will start to decrease and within six months will go back to your pre-treatment levels with denosumab. You need to make sure that um, two weeks or so before the polio injection is due that they actually have a serum calcium done, serum corrected calcium, because um, hypocalcemia, you'll get a calcium nador 
about two weeks after the denosumab injection, where the calcium levels will drop down. If you get somebody who is hypocalcemic, they will never want to take it again because they will get extreme muscle weakness. They will also put it down to statins, but it's actually due to the hypocalcemia. Muscle weakness, they feel sick and they feel really terrible. So it is very, very important that that is actually um, done and documented with it um, prior to taking it. Um, if they need to go off it, then you might wish to consider whether they need to go on to a bisphosphonate. When denosumab first came onto the pharmaceutical benefits, it was the authority, and it was for only three years. Now, as a result of these recent studies, it is now lifelong. If we look at the cost of the drugs on the pharmaceutical benefits, that came in as number, and the last year's figures came in as number eight of, as the most expensive medications. These biologicals are expensive. So I'm interested to see how the PBS copes with this particular one. Currently, we've got a few more years until it comes out of patent. When it comes out of patent, then you'll get a generic on the, of the biological, which will be a biosimilar rather than a straight generic. And that will be interesting because the government will be certainly trying to encourage us to use that because of the cost of it. But certainly, it is um, the compliance of a six-monthly injection is far better than the compliance of somebody taking a bisphosphonate once a week, um, you know, or even the once a month one. And uh, you probably got, uh, you have got a lower risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw with denosumab than you have got with your bisphosphonates. But the recommendations are for full dental checks prior to actually starting on polio because that risk is still there. And guess what? Two weeks ago, I had a patient in one of my nursing homes who was in the Royal Dental Hospital in Melbourne with osteonecrosis of the jaw after her third prolia injection. But looking at her history, um, going right back, she was a very high-risk lady. Um, she was a smoker. She has got, she's basically at end stage of life. Um, she had gingivitis of the gums as well. She had not had any dental work done for yonks. When I look further back into history, she had been on bisphosphonates for years. So was it the bisphosphonate that is still in the bones four or five years later, or was it the denosumab? Well, of course, the company who makes Prolia would say it was definitely the bisphosphonate. So we'll wait and see. Um, so it's full dental checks prior to having that done, because there is still a risk. And yours truly had to actually have a Prolia injection last Tuesday. So it's all very well for me to talk about medicines, but when one has to take one oneself, it's a whole different story. So I've read all I can find about prolia at present. Yes? I'm sorry, what you said about having the... Calcium, calcium, yes. Yeah, before the prolia, is that before every yes. dose? Yes, yes, yes. That is the current recommendation. You might decide that it's okay and do it every year, but um, I think, yeah, I, I'm going to read a bit more about that. It's just the risk and look at where their levels are. If they're tending low, then you certainly would. And to have a look at their calcium in their diet. You know, and are they taking calcium supplements? Maybe they should be taking calcium supplements for a couple of months before too. Uh, vitamin D as well? Uh, the vitamin D, I would get done at the same time because I, I, I'd like to make sure that they had sufficient levels with it. Yeah. So if you don't give the polio, you just push the out? Yes, yeah. yeah. You'd push the recall out until you got your cal if your calcium was low. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. So that's, that's something that's work in progress. You know, this is new stuff that's coming in that we're you know, starting to follow through a bit more. So very interesting, and certainly we're using a lot more, and the guidelines for hospitalisation after people have had a, a fractured knot, they are to be initiated on denosumab as they leave the hospitals. So there's a lot more preventive treatment going. And looking at my previous study, when does one start it? If she's 98 and she's been on it before and she's now going to an aged care home, do we continue on? And the answer is if she's mobile, probably yes. But if she was cognitively, uh, it's very hard to predict somebody's life expectancy. So again, we've got the government dollar at stake with a lot of this. So it's very expensive. So moving on to magnesium. Oh, another question. Um, do you still recommend that we say um, osteoporosis medication every five years? Like no. Again, that, that's a question with, um, on notice. But um, we used to say that we have a drug holiday after every four or five years because it, um, in my nursing home population, if I've got somebody who's on the decline and they've actually had four years of a bisphosphonate, I'd say, look, I think we're, we can safely actually cease it because they're still going to have a residual benefit for another four years. But the drug holiday is now sort of a bit... Um, it depends which endocrinologist or rheumatologist you speak to. So, again, I would go back to... The, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, does that sustain us? Would it help inform the discussion? 
Yeah. So we're going to go on a DEXA scan. Yeah, do a DEXA scan as well to see what sort of risk they are with it, and whether they're really high risk or whether they're uh, resumed. Um, yeah, so you will take three or four doses of the denosumab before you, and you only actually get about a 6% increase. You know, it's not as fantastic as what you think. So you've got to give all your risk factors, which are your, your calcium, your vitamin D, your uh, exercise, your weight-bearing exercise, all that all goes hand in hand with it. Really important. And your diet. Mm. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Yes, you can give it, uh, according to the company that I spoke to about this, uh, a month before is no problem. Mm. So yeah, that could be a really tricky because it could be right in the middle of it. Yeah, so that's a really, and at this stage they are not suggesting that um, people self-inject. I proposed that with the, one of the experts of the company because I said, well, like Humira, with adalutumab, biological, we're self-injecting. And they said, well, no, there is still that risk of an anaphylaxis. So yeah, you might be able to take it with, but then the problem is because it's got to be refrigerated, if you're travelling over the world, that's a problem. Yeah, difficult one. Mm. Each case on its merits and do what we can is sensible. You might be able to get a script in another country to get it or something, depending where you're travelling. Um, uh, um, yes, at least 10 minutes, 10 minutes to 30 minutes after the injection. 10 minutes at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. That was their argument why they, we couldn't have them self-injecting. Yeah, because of the anaphylaxis. Okay, now, magnesium. Magnesium is very, very popular. But do we have evidence for this extreme taking of magnesium? The answer is not really. But let's have a look at it. Hypermagnesemia uh, in severe new, uh, malnutrition, hospitalised, um, if you've got diarrhoea, malabsorption, bowel resection, hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia, phosphate depletion, and certain drug-induced causes can cause low magnesium. Alcohol sits there again. Yeah, alcohol hasn't got a lot going for it, has it? Antibiotics, <laughs> proton pumps, and, and more. Okay, so the mild deficiency, you won't feel anything. In the severe one, you'll get the muscle weakness and so on. And people are taking it for their nocturnal cramps. I don't have evidence to support it, but anecdotally, we sell buckets of it. So the mild cases, um, 500 milligrams, two to six times a day. If they get diarrhea, it's too much. Think about magnesium sulfate. It is the old Epsom salt that you can get from Bunnings to go around the lemon trees to stop the yellow on the trees. Okay, so you know, and some of you nurses would have administered Epsom salts for, do, uh, for constipation. Still used in some of the hospitals as well. So not a good idea in renal impairment. So where's the evidence for efficacy? Now, I haven't got a later Cochrane study. They say they didn't have any evidence. Cochrane 2012, 2014, I'm waiting for more studies with it. No evidence for widespread use. Magnesium oxide, uh, oxide was not significantly better. So um, I'm still searching for more stuff. There's a bit of evidence on New Zealand paper on showing magnesium for the cramps of pregnancy, but that's all I've been able to find for you. But anecdotally, I have a lot of people doing it. But I say to people when they come in, they say, how much are you taking? I say, well, look, have you had your bloods done on it? Oh, no. Well, how about you ask your doctor next time you go? Because it's easy to order, with your regular bloods, to order some magnesium. I say, it's a bit like putting um, air into your tyres without taking the tyre pressure. You wouldn't do that, would you? When I'm talking to the guys, I say, oh, no, I'd always take the tyre pressure because I relate to the cars. So, well, you're putting something in without knowing whether you really need it or not. So, not a bad idea to get magnesium checked, I think, together with your calcium, if you've got somebody who is, uh, you find is taking a lot or somebody who has got cramps. But I'd be looking at other reasons. Why are they getting those cramps at night? What else is going on? What's their peripheral circulation like? So we could be disguising some other signs and symptoms there. So zinc. Zinc's good for healing, and I'm sure Jan Rice down the road will be talking about it, of making sure that you have sufficient zinc in your diet if you've got difficulty in healing. Um, there's some studies that say that it shortens the duration of the cold by 40%. So that is a claim. It's not necessarily the evidence that I like. Some, certainly we use it in um, wound healing and we use traces for um, macular degeneration in the ARID study with it. So other products that are popular are CoQ10, uh, turmeric and fish oils. So let's have a look at those. 
CoQ10, now again, it depends on your cardiologist because some cardiologists will say, I want them to have CoQ10 after they've had their stents done or whatever, and others will say, I wouldn't have a bar, but it doesn't make any difference. So again, I'm guided by what your cardiologist, who is sitting right at the top of the pyramid, for this one wants as well. Um, unfortunately, there's no evidence for preventing the statin muscle pain with it, no clear evidence of benefit with it. There's conflicting results with it. I've looked at the randomised controlled study and the, uh, you cannot routinely uh, recommend it for the use with statins. I haven't got the evidence. If somebody wants to take it, so be it. But that came from the NPS. If you're not getting an NPS detailer out to your practice, I would, and I'm not an NPS person now, I was at one stage. Is anyone here NPS facilitators? No? But you can get your NPS facilitator to come around twice a year. They don't bring sandwiches and that like the drug reps do, but they bring you really good information and you can get your points for it as well and you can do some audits on it. I think they're doing, they've just done low back pain and they're doing anxiety this six months. Brilliant stuff, done in a nice four page broadsheet that um, gives you all that you need to know that you could use in a court of law. So, well, this is the latest information that NPS gave me. So, very handy. I think your role is keeping your GPs up to speed with their evidence. Can you do that? I can't. Yeah, make sure that you've got your latest MIMS, full MIMS. Make sure that you've got your Australian Medicines Handbook. Therapeutic guidelines should be there, the up-to-date ones. You need to have these resources. If they can use Clinician's Health Channel, show them how to use it if they've forgotten how to get onto the website. Because I had to do some remedial work for some GPs that had made some pretty serious errors, and I set them four or five little tasks to do, and they didn't know where to find the information. It was actually embarrassing. Mm. Oh, I think I would do that. They didn't know the washout period between certain antidepressants. Oh, look, I'd just stop them both, I'd stop it really slowly, and then I'd start again. Well, where's your evidence? How many days? Oh, look, I'll just do a few days. So I think we really need, and up to you, because you've got to get your practices accredited, have you, and I do a bit of looking at um, preparation for accreditation of practices. You need to do tick that box of it and make sure those references are up to date. Okay, turmeric. Turmeric is flavour of the year. You'll be excited by this one. Okay, lovely yellow colour. You can buy a lot from the green grocer. Encouraging results. We need more studies of it, but it is certainly PubMed has got some encouraging, um, and you can look up these ones later. I've given you the full reference, so you can pop that in with the titles and you'll be able to get onto those ones as well. But it's certainly showing a bit of evidence for our arthritis as well. Um, it's small studies at this stage, so if somebody wants to use it, I can quite say, well, there's some people that are finding this very useful. If you want to try it, this is what the dose that they we would use, and that's usually the 1,000 milligrams a day of the curcumin. Um, it, it's been compared to ibuprofen and to diclofenac with it. See how you go with it. Keep a pain diary. But, but the thing I want to do is try one thing at a time because if they want to try turmeric to get, or cucumin together with some glucosamine and chondroitin, together with some fish oil, together with some Panadol osteo, which one is actually making the difference? So we need to be able to do one thing at a time and say, this is helping you and or it's not helping you. Otherwise, they're wasting a lot of money, like about $40 a month, for, to buy that for them. And that's not good if you're a pensioner. So you can read... Now, if you don't get the conversation, please have a look at the conversation. It is a free online journal that comes out um, by the various universities. Um, it is written by top authors of various universities around Australia. It is fully referenced back to the good evidence-based reference. So if you're doing any advanced practice stuff or any assignments or nurse practitioners have got to do stuff, go on to it. It will enable you to write your essay very quickly. And it gives you the, most of the updates of health. The other thing you'll find is that often it will be in the age and in the Australian and it will be reprinted from the conversation. So, uh, and you can search on it very easily. So there's a lovely article there on uh, turmeric. Can it really shrink, think trends reduce pain and uh, kill bacteria? That's a little bit old, and it might, there might be an updated one yet, but that one came actually from Deakin, a person who um, specialises in nutritional sciences from Deakin University. Now, how about fish oils? We all like fish, but there's no placebo-controlled uh, trials of fish oil in the management of osteoarthritis. Unfortunately, there's no evidence for krill oil as being better and leave that for the whales for their food. You're very unfair on that one. So um, 
you've got to use a very, very high doses. You need to make sure that you're getting the total of the DHA and the EPA is 1,000 milligrams to start, maybe 2,000 for some people. Another person that you should have a look at is Gerald Quigley. Now, Gerald Quigley I know very well, and Gerald and I had um, a reunion of Alfred Hospital people a, few, a couple of Sundays ago, and Gerald and I agree to disagree on certain subjects. Now, Gerald is on uh, the 3AW, he has got a website, he's on a um, wellness show on the um, Channel 7 on a Sunday morning, he's on some of the night chats, and he's got a tr huge following. So if you want to know what's going on in complementary medicine, have a look at Gerald Quigley's website. Some of it I agree with, some of it I say ho-hum, I'm not too sure about that one, Gerald, but he often comes up with some very sensible suggestions, but his following, people are like disciples, that if Gerald has said it, um, he, they will believe it. So you need to be very much, just be familiar with it and have a, have a look at it. So he's saying, yes, this is rubbish that, you know, uh, these studies, fish oil does good, and in winter we're going to need more fish oil. That was, I had a look at his last night just to see what he'd, he'd put on the latest on that one. So yes, fish oil does have an inflammatory effect, and if you look at therapeutic guidelines, you can see here that you've got to have nine capsules a day of the one gram capsules, uh, but then it, depending what strength you've got of the EPA and your DHA, and there's a huge amount of confusion of the brands that are available, so the consumers need to look at actually what they're getting per day to work out the equivalence of it. If they want to, they can have the fish oil liquid, and that tastes pretty foul, but you follow it, swallow it down with an orange juice chaser, and then you might be okay with it. But it's, uh, it's peppermint flavoured as well, that um, fish oil liquid. But some people come and get it um, with us. So you need to be aware of those doses. It certainly will lower triglycerides. It doesn't have any effect on cholesterol, but it's a similar dosing that you need, which is a fair whack a day of it. So the evidence. Okay. 4 to 12 capsules containing 300 milligrams of DHA, EPA. Rheumatoid arthritis, therapeutic guidelines, nine capsules a day for very mild to give the inflammatory effect. Now, is it, does it affect INR, people who are on anticoagulants? The answer is no, it doesn't actually affect INR. Does it affect platelet fact, uh, function? I believe it does, but there's a recent paper that's come out that says that it doesn't. So nonetheless, I would be very cautious if somebody is taking fish oil and they're having surgery, I would want to check with their surgeon to see if they want to stop it prior to having surgery. So I certainly wouldn't be taking it with anticoagulants um, but, or with antiplatelet agents to increasing your risk of bleeding. But it doesn't actually alter that magical value. Okay, so the recommendations are a bit fishy. So, uh, so here's a paper published in the JAMA um, last year. Um, so talking about the lipid levels here, um, and you've got to have very high doses, up to 20 tablets a day, to actually do much with it. Okay, so here's a later meta-analysis. Uh, you see, I've done my homework for you guys, so that you, if you question it, you can have a look at the, and that's why I wanted you to have the literature in front of you, so that you, if you've got an interest in it, you can go and look it up, and you can read it yourself and study, and then decide what you want here. So that meta-analysis um, last year showed it had no significant, the fish oils had no significant association with fatal or non-fatal coronary heart disease. No support with the current recommendations. So that's where we are at present uh, with it, but things could change when we get the next meta-analysis out with more studies. So at present, a lot of people are still taking it, but I think the sales have actually gone down, which would be a bit of a blow for um, Blackmores. Okay, so what are the best supplements for osteoarthritis? And again, we can go back to the conversation. Tell your patients, tell your patients to throw away the chondroitin, glucosamine, and fish oil. And what they're suggesting now is boswala, uh, uh, the um, uh, pine bark thing, and the uh, M MSM and the turmeric with it. So that seems to be coming in. So glucosamine and chondroitin. There's a small number of people that will find it useful. It was done in an Italian study um, on a rotor brand and it was only of osteoarthritis of the knee. So some of my patients will say, yes, it really makes a difference. Some of them are taking um, glucosamine hydrochloride, some are taking the sulfate. There seems to be more evidence for the sulfate, and the dose I'd recommend would be 1,000 milligrams a day. By adding chondroitin to it, you're adding about $10 more per month, and your, the studies have shown that it decreases the joint narrowing by about a 0.6% decrease in joint narrowing. So there was one paper that came at the um, American Rheumatologist Conference that showed that 
um, high doses of chondroitin were as effective as um, 200 milligrams of silicoxib, but then six months later another paper came out with a similar methodology that showed it didn't make any difference. So again, I've got some people that say it really makes a big difference. So I listen to the patients. If they are feeling that it's helping well and they're doing other things, they're losing weight, they're doing their exercise, well, so be it. So this is how I compromise my evidence-based situation. It's not easy, and it's not easy for you as well. I don't think one can be too categorical about it because somebody said it's really helping. And I say, well, um, and then somebody says to me, I don't think it's helping. I said, well, maybe you could stop it. Oh, well, I will, but I'll tell you what, I'll just finish this bottle and then I'll stop taking it. And that happens all the time. They don't like to throw out the bottle at their... Even though they don't think it's doing any good, they will continue taking it until it's empty. Yeah, so it's all like, don't you know, eat up all your food, think of all the starving millions overseas that we, we brought up with from our parents. Yeah. So I think that's a bit of it as well. Now, prebiotics. Prebiotics are non-digestible carbohydrates. They act as a fertiliser to uh, increase the growth of beneficial bacteria in the gut. Highly controversial at this stage. So it's basically eat more fibre. So I've got no problem with eating more fibre. And that's really good for your constipation. And you can even have the skins of the kiwi fruit with it. Okay, go on. <laughs> Probiotics, okay. Um, so you some evidence... Um, for some strains, and there seems to be a bit of evidence for uh, Saccharomyces um, there. So again, VL3 may prevent um, remission in some evidence with ulcerative colitis. So I say, watch this space. Um, yeah, we're certainly into, you know, if we've wiped out all the um, healthy bacteria in the gut, maybe there's some evidence. But I don't have a huge amount here, and I've got the one with the, the study there showing a possible um, reduction in bacterial vaginitis. So... Macular degeneration, um, my, one of my colleagues, Peter van Wiesgarten, um, at the uh, acting head at the uh, Iron Air Hospital, says just eat your vegetables, your greens and your coloured vegetables. Don't bother about the ARIDS. But there is a bit of evidence for the ARIDS2 trial, and if you want to read more about that, get on to the Macular Degeneration Foundation with it. But you've got to get the right formula, and the one that is currently round, depending which brand you buy, um, you needed to take two rather than one that was on the label, but that may have changed. Okay, so some evidence. Oh, there's a glucosamine. Um, so watch out for your shellfish allergy. So that's the dose there that I've given you. Um, and there's many, many more as we could go on through. So um, if we look at what we're going to do for cold, because it's cold season coming up, echinacea, evidence is weak. Gerald Quigley said it's high, but I say that the scientific evidence says it's weak. Zinc, you might get slight duration effect of it. Garlic, there were a lot of people that wanted to take garlic and horseradish on that show, and they reckoned it was fantastic. Um, so um, I haven't got reliable studies to substantiate that. Vitamin C, once you've got a cold, has no effect on its duration or severity, but do keep up your fluids. And I'm still a great believer in cutting up a lemon and putting it in uh, the water and the microwave and or boiling it up on the stove, then adding some honey and suckling that down. Well, you're getting a lot of fluid and you're keeping yourself busy and people think that they're doing something. <laughs> <laughs> and it's tender, loving care. So if all else fails, you know, I'll get you a hot lemon drink and honey. Oh, would you really? Oh, that would be so nice. So do I have evidence? Yes, I have the care that goes around it. And, and, leave, and leave the skin, wash the lemon first, but keep the skin on because you're getting the oil of the lemon there. And it tastes nice. There you are. White willow, that contains aspirin. So, yeah, so watch out if you want anticoagulants. So aspirin, um, yeah, well, temporary relief from a sore throat. It's anti-inflammatory as well. Um, black elderberry, that's, that, that, they haven't got evidence for that. Chamomile helps um, sleep for some people, but I don't have a... Um, evidence, straight evidence for it, but some people like chamomile tea and that's fine. So the verdict, there's little evidence of herbal and vitamin supplements help to treat the common cold or the symptoms associated with the cold. So we have got lots and lots of products and here I'm advertising uh, Chemist Warehouse, which is my opposition from the pharmacy where I work once a week, um, but we can't count all these, we can't discount all these products, but certainly it's a money-making thing. So this is my most important slide of, the, of this talk. And that is the people that really need vitamins and minerals. So in pregnancy, we need to think about our prenatal 
vitamins are folic acid. Um, for breastfeed infants, vitamin D until weaning and iron from four to six months. Midlife, we may need D, we may need calcium, we may need 12. If they've had bariatric surgery, they're certainly going to need something. If you've got pernicious anemia, we need your B12. Celiac, Crohn's disease, we've really got to look at our um, and things that are not really absorbed with it. Osteoporosis, we need our vitamin D, our calcium, and we might want to look at our magnesium levels if they're getting cramps. Um, Age-related macular degeneration, you can have a look at that one. If they're not eating well, we may need some multivitamins. Long-term um, um, proton pumps may need B12 calcium, and we certainly have had reports of um, hypermagnesemia with um, proton pumps. So if they're on a proton pump and they reckon they need to take some magnesium, they're probably correct because it actually is decreasing the absorption of that and the long-term metformin. Okay, questions? Yes. First. So back today, I was told that we need deep cause injections because the oral bile of the ability is a deep cause tablet. It's really low. No, it hasn't. It's, it's slightly better with the sublingual. The only one that I would suggest would be the sublingual vitamin B12, which is made by um, one of the, um, uh, I can't remember the company, Bio something. Yep. Another question at the back? The Sorry, question was the, the, about. The question was about vitamin B12 injections. B12 uh, back, injections. Back in the day, um, we were told that you know we don't do oral tablets at all because of the bioavailability is quite low with tablets, yes. and I wanted to know if that evidence has changed with different formulations, and apparently it hasn't really. Except it, the, it's, uh, the only one that I would suggest would be the sublingual, and it's not Blackmores, but it's another one. And I know where it is on the shelf, and I can't think what brand it is, um, but there is one that some people. But again, if they're doing that, get the bloods done, and then you've got some evidence. We had another question down the back. Yep. Sorry, multivitamins and? And Yes. Yeah. Um, I think this is a positive ion part where it binds up to many patients and can't get a, like a viral like this, like that. Do they get an actual impact? Like, do we have to stop people taking multivitamins at the same time to get rid of viral? Or is there impact? Question on notice, and it would be something that I would refer to one of my colleagues at the one of the hospitals who are dealing with the antiretrovirals. I would be suspicious that it could cause a concern. Um, but again, you've got to look at there, make sure that the nutrition is up. And they often have a suboptimal nutrition with it at the same time. So yeah, um, I think it's a timing type thing. But I, I would like to get further information before I gave you an answer. Mm. OK. We're very quickly, in the last 15 minutes, or probably 14 and a half less now, go through the top frequently prescribed medicines and the controversies. And I apologise because I will be skipping some slides. I realise that we've got far too much, but I want to get the key points out with it. So our key points are when my thing decides to go. Oh, it's just going now. Okay. Um, ah, we will talk about statins, um, blood pressure lowering, PPI, antimicrobials, agents. The dose of metformin is controversial because the Australian Medicines Handbook has got differing often information than what the product information is, and we're using lower doses now, uh, lower um, thresholds. If your renal function is going down, we're not stopping it at 35 mils per minute. We're using 500 milligrams um, still uh, up for the older person, so that's something to watch. Um, usually the dose is um, 2 grams if they're 60 to 90 mils per minute, 1 gram if it's 30 to 60 mils per minute, and now 500 milligrams down if they're down to um, 15 to 30. So that has changed. That's one of the controversies at present, which is a good thing because it's mean less disruption for the patient. But do watch out for lactic acidosis. Escitalopram, as I wanted to alert you to that, and the older person, the maximum dose is 10 milligrams per day. With citalopram, the maximum dose is 20 milligrams per day. So that's for those people that are prescribing, particularly the nurse practitioners, because you've got more problems with possible elevation of QT interval with that one. The big study on aspirin was uh, released this year, and that was the Asprey study. And we're now saying in primary prevention, there's very little case for aspirin. In secondary prevention, yes. But in primary prevention, that means that they haven't had a heart attack, they haven't had a stroke. We used to put everybody with diabetes on low-dose aspirin. We don't have the evidence for that now. And that's the Asprey study, which was centred at Monash University in Victoria. Paracetamol, I wanted to bring up, and somebody raised me about that. Um, we were saying you go for therapeutic levels all the way through. The evidence is showing that we don't have um, 
evidence for it in a lot of the low back pains that they're taking it. So be guided by your patient. If your patient said it's not helping, it may not be helping. We're also reducing the dose down to a maximum of three grams if they're under 50 kilos per day, uh, under 50 kilograms. So it's three grams per day if they're under 50 kilos. So because of this inquiry into aged care um, with all the overuse of antipsychotics, I'm tending to reduce paracetamol down to three grams for most patients. So I've got two paracetamol sitting in the PRN orders and we're using that almost as a placebo to give them something. But um, I'm finding that some of them are doing very well on two in the morning and two mid-afternoon. And then we've got more left, for, uh, depending whether you're using the 665 milligrams. You could use two, three times a day, but you could have two regular and two PRN or you can go to the 500 milligrams a day instead of two at eight, 12, four, eight, which is what we were doing, um, going two, three times a day and leaving two as PRN. So that's where paracetamol is at present. There's a lot of papers out. A lot of them came out from Sydney University with Andrew McLaughlin, who's now the chair of the School of Pharmacy there. Highly reputable research saying, yeah, we don't think it's doing as much good as what it was. So interesting for some of you who, we've all been trying to get them on therapeutic levels, some of them it works, some of them it doesn't. Okay, so now let's have a look more in depth of the others. Um, so the top 10 drugs per population you can see here, you've got the statins, you've got perindoprosquepton, amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Watch out for puppy ankles. Watch out for reflux. It's a smooth muscle relaxant. You've got your sartans, so, and then you've got your proton pumps, and you've got metformin. Hello? When I talked to some doctors and nurse practitioners, I remember a lecture that I listened to Leon Pitterman, who headed up the Monash Medical School at one stage, and he said, Jen, I only know 20 drugs, and that's all I use. And I thought, I can't believe this, Leon. Now, if we had more time, I'd like nurse practitioners to write down the top 20 drugs that you would use. It's a very interesting exercise, and you find that you cover most of the common conditions because you go back to your favourites that you've got your knowledge with. And this is what this, is sh this data is showing. So that's the 80-20 rule. Know your common drugs really well. The other ones, if you don't know, you're referring off to a specialist. So know your top 20. Well, so I'm done doing top 10 today, and we can group them down to about three classes. So if we go by prescription counts, we can go down to the statins, the PPIs, and the antibiotics. This slide is really upsetting to me because the last, this year and the last year is the first time that we've had antibiotics in the top 10 most frequently prescribed medications in Australia. We haven't had this before. There it is, Keflexin, top of the pops, amoxicillin and amoxiclav. So, you know, if we haven't got need to do something about it, we do need to. And if we look at the top cost, there's the cost there and you can see your denosumab sitting there and you've got your adalidumab up here for your rheumatoid arthritis with it. Um, and your, some of your inflammatory bowel diseases, and you've got your antiretrovirals, and you've got your IZEPT, um, the ones for the um, macular degeneration. So, and, and menazolizumab, also for macular degeneration. Look at the bill of it. Look at the cost of it. Hey, our treasurers need to look at this. Okay, we've also got change of names to update you. So if you haven't got all the names, it's not a mistake that I've been writing amoxicillin with an I, and it's not a change that I'm writing furosemide the way it is rather. So if you haven't got that, get onto that website and make sure that you all know that it's not a typo with furosemide and um, uh, uh, some of them are, are terribly hard to, to get. The furosemide, endometrin, I think I was, I'm stammering. So it's in the, they've taken out the H. But interesting, they haven't moved to the American acetaminophen for paracetamol. So it still stays that way. So lots of questions here, and I'm not going to go through them now in the interest of time, but I want you to be able to answer these questions because these are the questions that your patients are going to ask you when you go and take their blood pressure. And as nurses, you need to know these because you can either kill the statins or, or oh no, I wouldn't take the statins. How many people stopped taking the statins after that catalyst show about four years ago? And how many people still remember it? So, yes. So you need to know and you need to reassure them because the adherence or the compliance with statins is low. And this latest thing that the government were trying to put in of having two months prescriptions at once, and the pharmacy girl put up their hand and said, oh, no, we don't like this because we give information every time we dispense the prescription. Uh, we do in the pharmacy where I work, but we don't have a lot of pharmacies. 
uh, because I do ask when I'm giving out a statin, how's it going? Have you had your, your bloods done recently? I try and involve them in it. Are you winning? When do you have to have your bloods? You've got another, or have you got any uh, adverse effects? So, but a lot of people don't do that. They just say, pay at the register on the way out. Where you go. So are they, well, we could answer these very quickly. Yes, a statin can help. Too much cholesterol? Yes, it's going to increase your risk. Um, how do they lower? That's a complicated one. Who should take them? Those that are at risk. They're not the only way. We've got to reduce the risk factors of all the risk factors, the smoking cessation, the exercise, the weight, the diet, and so on. Is it safe? Well, no medicines are completely safe, but we will monitor to make sure. Yes, they can cause muscle damage. One in 10 people can get muscle symptoms from statins. So let us know if you do get any muscle pains. Will I have memory loss? It was one paper, but we haven't got the evidence for that one. Do they cause diabetes? They may actually make it more, you may find that diabetes does emerge, but it was just below the level anyhow, and maybe it's a good thing that we have found out, because now we can actually take some safeguards about it. What's the strong evidence? The strong evidence is helping you to reduce from having a heart attack or a stroke. I'm not sure whether I should take a statin. What should I do? You say, go and get the prescription made up, and we'll monitor you closely to make sure that it's doing you benefit. Got to praise the benefits of these medications if you've done or your GPs have done an assessment. But because you can kill it for them, you say, I wouldn't take that if I was you. Or for pharmacists handing it out saying, Oh, you're having this one. Oh, I wouldn't have that. And it's gone. The drug companies hate us then. Okay, um, so if we look at the cholesterol trial study, that one gives you those sort of figures that you can actually make a note of and remember with it. So it is basically risk versus benefit and the benefits are higher than the risks at this stage, as long as we are monitored. So, yep, the 1 in 10 may experience muscle pain or weakness is, was actually quite disturbing to me, but that varies from myalgia to rhabdo, uh, right to the f uh, myopathy and then to your full-blown rhabdomyolysis where you get a full breakdown of the muscle and elevated uh, CK levels with it. So a little bit of muscle pain. So we need to use the lower doses. We need to watch out for drug interactions. And as an aside, simvastatin, 80 milligrams is the one that I got my vibrating parts go, oh, I don't like this in an older person because you've got a much greater risk of having that myopathy with it. So you're safer on the lower doses of the um, uh, torvastatin or the rosivastatin. The potency of pravastatin is not quite as great with it. So key points, absolute risk. If they've got a high risk, then we'd go for it. Um, it's generally... Um, uh, intolerance is really life-threatening, so it's monitoring all the time. So we'll skip over a lot of these. The blood pressure tablets. Now you've got your ACEs, your top ones are your ACEs, your ARBs, your thiazides, your um, beta blockers, and your calcium channel blockers. And I've already mentioned the prazosin. So it's the same time each day, adherence, no crushing, watching out for the combinations. I have a lot of dispensing errors or prescribing errors where the doctor has selected the one below on the chart when they're actually coming up through medical director or best practice and we get in the pharmacy, we get one without the hydrochlorothiazide when it should. So if you have any part of that, do check to see what's happening with it because it, it does happen with it as well. And I warn any, and you guys are taking the blood pressure, so please warn them about when they're on their blood pressure tablets that they're Blood pressure is different when they're lying, when they're sitting, when they're standing, and they need to keep up their fluids. So I've got a whole lot on blood pressure, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skim through those, and you can read it at your leisure. The SPRINT study was an interesting one where it said how low is low, but when you look at it, you'll find that there were a lot of exclusions, and in the older person, we're not going as low as what the SPRINT study recommendations are. We're tending to travel a bit higher because of the risk of postural drop with it, because of the risk of renal impairment and so on. There were lots of exclusions in the study. So that's all the SPRINT study that you can look for, and you can read that through. The proton pump inhibitors, because they're major, um, they, the things that make reflux worse are listed there for you. Um, the place of the high-dose ones are really only if people have got high risk, such as early dysplasia, Barrett's esophagus, ongoing hiatus hernia, or medications that actually are very irritant to the tummy. So we're trying to reduce the doses down 
from the 40 milligrams twice a day to 40 milligrams once a day down to 20 milligrams and even to PRN. Once an ulcer is healed, they do not have to stay on proton pumps forever. Once their reflux is controlled, and it might be due to a calcium channel blocker, which is causing the relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, or it might be even of overuse of Ventolin, which actually causes that relaxation as well, we might be able to get them down. So we need to be very much aware of that stepping down because they'll get that hyper uh, uh, rebound effect with it. And I think most of that is all there for you with the rebound acid hypersecretion. The NPS have been out detailing that as well. So there are adverse effects, but they're generally pretty small with it, the uh, diarrhea, the fluctuants, um, they're pretty small and only just higher than placebo. The other thing with the proton pumps is if you've taken out all those, uh, the acid out of the tummy, you're more likely to get infections. So they're the first ones on their overseas cruise that are going to get the gastro on the cruise. Okay? because they haven't got it, so they need to have meticulous hygiene with that. It's a good thing that you can talk to them about because you're probably giving them their travel injections as well. So decreased B12 I mentioned, maybe low magnesium, and because of the calcium absorption, they have a risk of fractures. So we need to look at their calcium intake with the proton pump people and watching out for pneumonia. So um, there's... Uh, Low, but the volume, because we're using so many, as you can see from those government studies, this is why we're starting to get the post-marketing surveillance studies around. So lots of consequences there, and time is against us, so we can read this. I've covered most of that. The low calcium we've covered, it's all there. The magnesium, the B12. Um, so you've got all the papers that you can read. Bottom line is to establish the indication, recommendations. And our last bit is on the aged care homes of the study of the antimicrobial use. As I've mentioned before, kefalexin, number one, and number two were those antifungals that were really spoken about. So what you can do is watching it and saying that it's not always necessary to use an antimicrobial agent. They all have side effects with it. They're all going to get diarrhoea, but if they get copious diarrhoea, they need to be on the phone to you coming back. And the recording of allergies is something that we need to go into with a bit more detail had one man that said, I'm allergic to penicillin. Oh, tell us what happened. Well, actually, actually, um, I've never taken it. But my neighbour did, and he got very bad. He got very sick taking it, so I don't want to take that drug. So please, can you put your indications on your referrals, please? Or oh, a bit more about it, got a rash, or immediate anaphylaxis, or what happens, because it helps our decision-making a bit. And you can take them with a pill. I thought that was a nice note to finish on. And a lot of people think, they say, oh, you can't take it with a pill. But it's only the rifabutin, rifampicin and griseoforvin that are the real problems. The other thing they ask, can I have a drink with my antibiotics? And if I say no, they say, well, I won't take the antibiotic. <laughs> so I say, yes, but not as too much because you'll get dehydrated and that won't help your curing. So sorry about rushing there, but you've got all the information. We've got the key points. We'll spend more time on our um, others. Thank you.